This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. The legal information presented on In Legal Terms is meant to provide general information about the topics discussed and is not necessarily the opinion of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. The information conveyed does not create any type of attorney-client relationship. Please consult an attorney provider before making any decisions about your specific legal questions. Welcome to In Legal Terms from MPB Think Radio. It's the show all about you and your rights. Our host is Professor Richard Gershon of the University of Mississippi School of Law. I'm Liz Gill. Hello, Professor Gershon. Good morning, Liz. I hope you had a good weekend. And uh, and I'm excited for this show because uh, today we're going to be discussing education law, which is a really important and current topic uh, in Mississippi and around the country. And we're, we're really fortunate to have Chauncey Spears here today. He is the education policy analyst of uh, the Mississippi Center for Justice. Uh, Mr. Mr. Spears, welcome. We're glad to have you. And would you please tell us a little bit about uh, your background? I know you worked for the Mississippi Department of Education before joining, joining MCJ. Right. Um, well, good morning, and I'm glad to be here as well. Um, uh, yeah, I worked. Um, I moved to Mississippi actually the same summer of Katrina. In fact, two right two weeks before Katrina hit, my wife, or me and my wife, we moved to to Jackson, uh, and um, I started working at the department soon after uh, as the social studies specialist at that time. So that was 2005, I think, uh, and uh, around 2006, of course, uh, the uh, the the bill uh, for the civil rights education law uh, came into effect, uh, and it kind of hit me uh, blindsided because I think there was work already in place before we moved here to do that. Uh, and so, working with the state department, and working with uh, the civil rights education commission uh, uh, to see how they can implement civil rights and human rights understandings into the K twelve uh, education, uh, I got I got to meet a lot of people on the civil rights education commission, which was a thrill. People who worked with the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, people who worked with the Student Body Coordinating Committee back in the sixties, people who worked with people like Bob Moses and and and, and worked with Megger Evers and things like that. Um, uh, Leslie Macklemore was actually on the commission, you know, who, who led a, the, a, a lot of great work in northern Mississippi to get voting rights and equity for people there. Um, and so in 2010, of course, uh, we revised the state standards to include civil rights and human rights understandings in, in all of the required social studies courses, K-12. There are kindergarten social studies courses. People may not know that. Uh, uh, and, and so in, in the course of time, in, in my, my role at the department grew. I you know, kept started working with gifted and talented programs throughout the state uh, and, and eventually working with uh, uh, textbook and instructional materials procurement throughout the state in each moment. There was an opportunity to work uh, in, in issues of educational equity and access, uh, talking about uh, things uh, like, like access to textbooks and instructional materials, to who had access to the gifted and talented programs throughout the state, advanced learning programs, et cetera. You know, and so, um, so the, the opportunity to come to the Center for Justice here uh, arose, and uh, I, w- I was blessed with the opportunity, and I'm just, uh, we're here now. Uh, dealing with this issue, uh, so 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 it's been a, been a good journey. Uh, I've, I've met a lot of great people here in Mississippi. I, I've become an, uh, an adopted Mississippian. They've told me so. So so I'm I'm, I'm here for the, for the long haul, ready to do some great work. We're talking today about your rights and how you got your rights, and it's a tricky subject right now. You know, your rights might have be different from the rights I have had or people who are like me or look like me and the rights I had people who have looked like me haven't always been the same as people who look different from me so we're trying to talk about how that should be taught and are there new restrictions now on how teaching of history and how your rights were obtained. We would love folks to send us an email with their comments or their questions. We won't use your name if you don't want us to, whatever, however you want to do it. Our address is legalterms at mpbonline.org. We're very excited to have Chauncey Spears, education policy analyst from the Mississippi Center for Justice with us today. Yes, and, and Liz, our main focus today will be on the state's um, anti, um, 
uh, critical race theory agenda. And we'll get to that in later segments, but we, we, in this segment, we want to talk a little bit more about some of the other work that MCJ is doing on educational issues. Uh, would you talk about the center's work on uh, educational disparity, for example? Yeah, yeah. Educational disparity, um, uh, it, it's, it's has tentacles in a variety of areas. Um, uh, I, 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 love, I love the work that we do in, in trying to represent uh, parents and local, local uh, families uh, if their students uh, have um, in the, in the IEPs, individualized educational plans. Uh, uh, many times we find that the services that those IEPs require by law uh, may or may not be rendered uh, in effective ways to meet the needs of the students who, 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 uh, who have them. And so uh, MCJ has, has represented families in trying to help districts to better um, render services to students who may need them on IEPs. And also, too, um, we talk about students who may find themselves uh, getting disciplined at school or be corporal punishment, maybe suspensions or expulsions. MCJ has worked um, in, in ways to uh, help represent families who may feel like that the the the, the, the the discipline wasn't um, um, equitable. It, it wasn't something that uh, was going to help their students. And what we find all the time, even with students with IEPs and with these uh, discipline issues, that there are racial disparities with that. There are disparities with class in terms of how districts um, uh, uh, deliver services to people uh, under those particular programs. And so MCJ has been very instrumental over the years in dealing with that. Um, uh, uh, one of the um, things we're really working with now is this, um, the, the issues with um, you know, learning loss during the COVID shutdowns. Uh, and we, as you may know, um, when the pandemic hit in March 2020, uh, everybody was blindsided, including uh, us as educators. Uh, and so um, the, one of the, the ways that we tried to help alleviate some of the challenges of that was to try to uh, have a, a virtual schooling or, or schooling where kids just logged in online to do that. But what we found was that in a lot of rural areas and a lot of areas where there may be um, uh, economic disparities, uh, that a lot of people didn't have access to the broadband capacity they needed to, to actually take full advantage of the learning experience. And this resulted in disparate educational attainment uh, during those times. So, so we're looking at a project right now where we're trying to document the voices of those people who were adversely affected by um, virtual learning during the 2020-2021 school year. Uh, and hopefully, uh, we, we, a report we're going to produce was going to be able to get raise some awareness about you know the, the needs for students with broadband uh, access, and hopefully, with district going forward, will be more sensitive to those needs of those students, those communities. So there's a lot of good work we're doing here at MCJ in the area of educational disparities. We have a call. We're going to go to Columbia and talk with Greg. Greg, thanks so much for calling into in legal terms today. What's your comment or question? Hey, good morning. Thank you for taking my call. It's Columbus, not. Oh, uh, sorry. I'm from I'm from Mississippi, <laughs> but uh, I was just wanted to comment. You know, as far as historical wise, you know, I'm to the point where people can teach whatever you want. I don't care. But what the fact of the matter is, when a child graduates high school, they're going to be out in the real world and the economy. And the employer you work for doesn't care what you were taught in high school as far as your history. The college that you go to, they don't care what you were taught as far as history. You either perform in those classes, you get the college degree, you move on with that. If you want to teach people whatever you want, that's fine. But the fact of the matter is reality sinks in very quickly when someone graduates high school. I went to a public school, and uh, I'll have to say um, the school I went to I thought was pretty nice. But you get out of it what you put into it. I had uh, fellow students who did nothing. Uh, they smoked drugs. They came to school high. And... Um, probably half of them are dead right now because I'm age 60 and they've thrown their lives away. But that's their decision that they made early on. I try to impress with my own children, the decisions you make right now in school will last a lifetime out there. Uh, I have two children left out of five that were at home and I've supported each and every one of them without any help from the outside. I work two jobs, I'm retired from one. And so there you go. But the point is that I stress with my own kids is 
you can throw away your life very early on, graduate high school with a piece of paper that means absolutely nothing because they gave you grades in school. And then you have nothing when you get outside of school. I stress to them that when they do attend the community college, and that's a great place to start out, go for the grades. And then when you transfer to a larger college like MSU or another state university, then excel with that. You get a college degree, and then you can end up, as far as like my career, I was a pilot in the military. But even when I joined back in 1982, we couldn't get people to join up in the Marines Aviation Program. They would walk right by our table at the student center at the university where I went to. And the vast majority of them already were indoctrinated that the military is bad. And so, well, that's fine. Take advantage of whatever you can out there. But the point is, history and how you want to teach. I don't care how my uh, ancestors came to this land from Sweden or from Ireland or from the Netherlands, because I'm, as one British person when I was in England put it, you're American, you're all a bunch of mutts. And that's fine. I don't care. Call me what you want. But when I'm out there in the economy and I'm working for a job, when I'm working for my career, studying for an education, nobody cares what I do. But when you do achieve, then the doors open up with greater employment opportunities. So I think to a large degree, we're doing kids an injustice by focusing on where did you come from and what happened to your ancestors. Uh, frankly, I don't care. I think there's a level playing field out there. There's public schools I went to. I drove, I rode on a public bus. I went to a school that had air conditioning. Most of them do today. I had free textbooks. And, uh, yep, my parents packed my lunch because when I went to school, there wasn't a free lunch, but we made it. And as a result, I did well in school for the most part because I chose to do well. Thanks, Greg. We appreciate you calling in today. Uh, Mr. Spears, did you want to comment about that? Well, yes. Uh, uh, he, you know, uh, Thanks for the call. Um, I would... I would note that I think that you know, the history that you learn is very important in terms of what we see in the 21st century world of work and democracy. Uh, uh, when we talk about what's on the workforce, yeah, pr productivity is key, um, but how productive can you be if you can't work with others who may not think like you, believe like you, look like you, because you don't have a firm grasp of uh, the historical context under which they you know, uh, have arrived at the position they're at. Um, uh, if you don't respect, you know, the diversity that's in the workplace, you know, how productive will you be? Uh, you know, our, and, and we talk about democracy as well. We, we, we're living in a world that's flat now. We talk about information technology, making, you know, things that were, you know, probably 40, 50 years ago distant. Now they're very apparent. Uh, so that you should have a firm grasp of, you know, the history that's happening around the world and, and, and how global economy works and things of that nature in order to understand, you know, your current context. You know, so so I think that history education in particular, but social education in general is very important. Uh, and, and and how the education is rendered is also very important in terms of what is, what our democracy and what our workforce will look like going forward. So, so yeah, you know, I, I think that we there are disparities uh, in how the education is rendered. So, so I, I would think that is very important that the kind of history and social studies education you receive, even in high school. We are talking about our education laws and what is being passed lately and what has been gone on in the in the past send us your emails to our address legal terms at mpbonline.org we're discussing new laws around education with our guest chauncey spears education policy analyst at the mississippi center for justice just who is the mississippi center for justice I'm going to tell you next. You're listening to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio.
Hello, I'm Dr. Nancy Lotridge Anderson, president of New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advising firm and co-host of Money Talks. For over 10 years, Money Talks has been answering your personal financial questions and sharing knowledge about money management. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart devices podcasting platform. This is in legal terms. Not everyone has a chance to listen to our show live. If you've missed any of our program, you can listen to the whole show on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. Our host is Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law. I'm Liz Gill. This morning, we're talking about the laws around teaching certain subjects and with our guest, Chauncey Spears, education policy analyst at the Mississippi Center for Justice. Now, the Mississippi Center for Justice partners with national, regional, and community organizations to develop and implement campaigns designed to create better futures for low-income Mississippians and communities of color in the areas of educational opportunity, financial security, health care, affordable housing, and other vital issues. If you want more information, their website is mscenterforjustice.org, and that's F-O-R in the website. We have a couple of calls. Let's go to John in Jackson first. John, thanks for calling into In Legal Terms today. What's your comment or question? All right. First of all, let me put this disclaimer out there. I just come in. You may have covered this already. Uh, but I heard in the news something about our legislatures making some type of law not to teach critical race theory in our schools. Um, have you guys covered that this morning already? We were just about to, John, so I'm glad you've stepped in and gotten us on that topic. Uh, Professor Gerson? I, excuse right. me, before you we, before we, before we answer, I got just a couple more follow-ups, and then I'm going to hang up and just listen. Great, John. Um, all right. Now, when we say critical race theory, is there like a book that found that say critical race theory here? Or are they basing it on material in certain books that may have a critical race theory overtone or undertone that they're wanting not to be taught? Um, because it, 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 the, way I, the way I perceive things is in something such as Roots, someone may perceive that book to be a form of critical race theory based on all of the um, things I hear, criticism I hear about what folks believe critical race theory is. And I'll hang up and, and listen to the answer. Those are, those are great questions. I, I, I will say one thing. Uh, we've been teaching critical race theory in law schools for 30 years, and you can't really approach the law without looking at the role that race has played in it. I'm not really sure why critical race theory has become uh, the topic of 2022 or 2020 started in 2021. But I mean, it's not like it's something that's new. And you're right. I mean, roots is something that if people study, you have to you have to evaluate the role race played um, in slavery, for example. I mean, you can't ignore that. That's critical race theory. We talk, when we talk about it in law school, one of the cases I, I think is, is a classic case is Plessy versus Ferguson. Mm-hmm. which was the U.S. Supreme Court's decision uh, that uh, separate but equal was okay. Um, and, you know, and that kind of gave rise to separate schools. And, and uh, you know, you look at the Constitution of 1890 of Mississippi, and it still uh, has language in it that says that the races will not be educated together. So, um, you know, that's, those, are, those are issues that you have to talk about. So I'll, t- I'll, I'll ask our guests, I'm sorry to, to get into that, but I think, you know, that's really, uh, my concern though really is, are we going to start banning books? Um, because once we start doing that, then we, we've gone down a really, really dangerous path. But Mr. Spears, what, I mean, what, what have you seen in terms of these issues of academic freedom and critical race theory? Well, you, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, it's hard to talk about history, especially the history in the United States, 
without considering the concept of race and what racism's impact had, um, not only just in slavery, but but in, in court cases like you mentioned uh, and how uh, resources were distributed, uh, we can it, it, race impacts so much of our history that I find it impossible to say that we can teach a history that you know involves race and people not you know talk about race, not talk about racism, you know, and and so and, and the fascinating thing is, is that when you look at the proposed legislation, you know, the legislation that was actually. Uh, brought out of the Senate Education Committee and voted on the Senate last week here in Mississippi, the language is pretty broad and vague. You know, for instance, um, I'll I'll quote here. It says that uh, schools cannot be directed or compelled or compel students to affirm that any sex, race, ethnicity, religion, or national origin is inherently superior or that individuals should be adversely treated based on such characteristics. You know, we don't do that. You know, you know, the, the standards don't call for that to be taught. Um, books don't say that, OK, you know, students should be treated inferiorly or, or superiorly because of their race or ethnicity or anything like that. But as you said, uh, when we see how these laws are playing out in other states, we see things like books getting banned. We see things like presentations being disregarded and lessons being kicked out and teachers being fired for approaching subjects that some people may feel uncomfortable about. Uh, um, Just for example, I just saw just yesterday there was a, a professor in Florida who was going to do a professional development for some history teachers at the local school district. He was going to talk about the civil rights movement before and after Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, with the school district, you know, in Florida, the law is already passed. So when the school district was concerned that some of the presentation might contain some critical race theory, quote unquote, um, you know, and, and the professor shared with them was like, I'm just talking facts. <laughs> you know, there was a civil rights movement before Dr. King. There's a civil rights movement after Dr. King. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not perpetuating any kind of theoretical um, ideas about the superiority or inferiority of any race or, or, or ethnicity. Yeah, I'm just telling you what happened. But the school system canceled the, pr- the presentation. They canceled the training. You know, so we, we have to figure out then how can we move forward with such a law in place if the law itself doesn't talk anything about you know, actual critical race theory or actual history. It, it, it talks about, you know, you know, you know, uh, uh, teaching of, of racism in such a way that doesn't happen. But yet uh, we have these these subjective ways of seeing how lessons can play out. And that is dangerous in terms of academic freedom of teachers and, and professors throughout the state, because uh, we need the, the, the protection of academic freedom in order to allow for the exploration of, of, of ideas, exchange of ideas, exploration of concepts, uh, to understand history, to understand economics, to understand our geography issues, to understand, you know, the things of social studies uh, and, and the things in, in, in academia, you have to have a, a freedom to, to explore ideas and concepts. Uh, and, and so when you have laws like this that seem to curb that, you know, what is that going to do in terms of the education that our children are receiving? You know, I think a caller earlier talked about being prepared to produce in the workforce or produce in the classroom as you go to college. If we have an education that's crippled by a law that does not allow for the free exchange of ideas and, 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 and for uh, uh, professors and teachers to have the freedom to, to engage students on those levels, they won't be prepared to be successful and productive in the 21st century world of working democracy in that instance. And so we're doing our students a disservice if we just simply allow for these laws to take place and the subjective uh, enforcement of those laws. Yeah, uh, you know, that's, I think that's so well said. And uh, it is about having a, fr- a free exchange of ideas. And, and I, I've already heard of um, K through 12 librarian uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, that uh, is concerned about what books they're going to have to take off the shelf. That that's really kind of scares me a lot because mm-hmm. 
people need to read and critically think for themselves. That's what, you know, I mean, the critical part of critical race theory is let's just think about this critically. Let's 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 have a real discussion about what happened. I mean, look at World War II. We mm -hmm. we put Japanese American American citizens. We took them and put them in what were essentially concentration camps. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, because of their race, we didn't do that to German citizens. Right. So I mean, how, but how can you even teach that history without recognizing? Mm -hmm what happened there and that's the part that i think i worry about because we we can totally um uh, you know uh put whitewash is a good word for it, our history uh, by ignoring the, that very fact and so uh you know when, when the when the state says you can't you can't do that uh, that's a real concern to me yeah yeah history in america especially in, especially in mississippi history um, I'm even expanded to other academic areas of uh, literature, uh, uh, of art, uh, economics. Uh, in Mississippi, without race, it's strictly propaganda. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's little more than propaganda. You, you mentioned your World War II and the book burnings and things of that nature. That was to squelch ideas. That was to contain ideas, and that's what propaganda does. And so, and, and that and that can't you can't form a strong, engaged, robust democracy if people's understanding of history and culture and things of that nature is controlled by politics. You know, you have to have a diverse array of ideas and participation in order for our democracy to be strong and truly representative of who we are as a people. You know, and so so this uh, uh, legislation, as, as innocuous as the language may seem, you know, you know, but when we took at enforcement, it, it has tentacles that are wide ranging and we ought to be aware of it and ought to be voicing our concerns to our representatives to say, hey, we need to protect the freedom of teachers and, and, and professors in our public classrooms to engage our students in the ways that are going to actually prepare them to be productive in the 21st century world of work and democracy, because calming those ideas is not going to help us to move forward as a state beyond our ideological and historical divides. Mr. Spears, what does the does the Mississippi Center for Justice have any plans regarding the legislation that has uh, passed the Senate? Well, right now, um, there are a couple of things that we're doing. Uh, uh, first, I'm happy to to report that we finally were able to launch the teachhistory.ms website, teachhistory.ms, teachhistory.ms. What that is, is it's, it's a repository of, of ideas, of, of, of ways that you can get involved uh, to notify your representatives about the importance of teaching a full and honest history of the state of Mississippi in every area of the state, in every classroom, uh, have it as accurate as possible, give our teachers the freedom, trust our teachers as the ex expert, licensed, and trained professionals that they are to be able to, con to teach the history, uh, both the good and the bad, in a way that's going to empower our students, not going to degrade any student, but it's going to empower our students to, to take on our challenges contemporarily uh, with information and with empathy that's going to allow us to have real solutions. Uh, so Teach History MS is, 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 is a website that's launched recently. Uh, we, we're gathering support from various uh, uh, partners, uh, both in academia and, and, and in advocacy, uh, uh, through various uh, means to, to, to get involved, to support letters, and, and, and going on uh, uh, shows like this to talk about this issue, to, to raise it in a way that can raise awareness for people to get involved with this. Uh, uh, and so, and we're also going to be monitoring, I know, should, should a law pass? That, 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 that's going to say that uh, supposedly uh, CRT or critical race theory is, is banned from teaching, we're going to be looking at, you know, how is this playing out in local communities? You know, you know, are, you know, are, are there issues with uh, First Amendment rights and equal protection rights uh, that are being uh, examined by or, or being exposed by uh, the enforcement of this law? in different communities. And so in other states, we've seen that lawsuits have been launched. Uh, uh, and so and so, so we'll be monitoring as well, uh, should, should this law pass, uh, to see what we can do as advocates to protect um, academic freedom and the rights of our, of our uh, teachers and, and, and uh, professors and students uh, in our classrooms. 
Mr. Spears, do you know uh, what led, is there anything that led the Senate to pass this bill, to uh, introduce it and then pass it? Um, your guess is as good as mine. I, 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 it seemed to be a groundswell after the summer of 2020 uh, when, when you saw a lot of protests uh, around the, the, the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Um, anything that I would bring would be speculative. You know, I, I'm not in the Senate. I didn't bring the bill. Uh, uh, you know, so, but I, I have no idea. It seems that, you know, at some point, there were some people who, who, who saw a need to, to, to address something that really wasn't, you know, there uh, to, you know, my estimation. I, I don't see where any of the critical race theory that, 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 uh, that Richard would be teaching in his, in his law school classes is occurring in, in, in fifth grade and eighth grade classrooms around Mississippi. You know, so I, I really can't tell you, you know, what necessarily prompted it. Uh, um, I don't. I don't know where this is actually meeting any needs of, of anybody in our community. Uh, you know, like I said, it seems to do more to 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 take away some freedoms from our teachers and educators around the state. Uh, it's going to curb what we need to know uh, about our history in, in very vital, important ways in order to encourage robust civic engagement after they graduate. Yeah, you know, I think honestly, and this is my opinion and not the opinion of MPB, and I agree with you, it's just speculation, but this is just a distraction, in my opinion, to take away. It's the same thing with the, the, the transgender uh, the people being on, on sports team issue that, that when there hasn't even been that issue in Mississippi, our, our legislature addresses things that, uh, uh, you know, maybe there are people who, who want them to address. Uh, and they avoid addressing things like expansion of, of health care and, and, and Medicaid um, and, and issues like that. So, you know, there are big issues they could be tackling. This is this is not even an issue. We don't even and I, I, we don't even teach critical legal theory in every class. It's uh, we have a class called critical legal theory that students can sign up for. Uh, we do talk about um, uh, diversity issues in, in, in many of our classrooms. I do it in Wills and Estates because there is there is a an issue that uh, that, that is involved in uh, in estate planning. We talked about heirs' property, for example, mm -hmm. and we've had we've had uh, MCJ talking about heirs' property on the show before. Um, so, um, yeah, I think it's a it's it's a it, it it it's something that is a distraction. They can say, look what we've done, um, and it's political. Strictly political doesn't serve a real purpose other than to say we stop this, uh, whatever, because you think there are people who think it's, it sounds bad, so we're going to stop it. Email us your questions and comments. Our address is legalterms at mpbonline.org. We're talking with Chauncey Spears, education policy analyst at the Mississippi Center for Justice, about laws and policies around teaching certain subjects in Mississippi. What does the Mississippi Center for Justice do? I'm going to tell you that next. You're listening to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. You're listening to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. Professor Richard Gershon is our expert host. I'm Liz Gill. We do hope you'll subscribe to our podcast, or you can just find MPB Think Radio recordings on the website mpbonline.org slash radio.
At the heart of the Mississippi Center for Justice's mission is to create a just society, to a desire to build healthy communities across Mississippi. You can follow along with the center's activities by following them on Twitter. Their handle is at justice the number four, Mississippi. And if you'd like to support the Mississippi Center for Justice, you could buy a T-shirt or a mug or a face mask at the MCJ store on their website or donate to them, mscenterforjustice.org, with the F-O-R spelled out, is their website. Our guest is Chauncey Spears, Education Policy Analyst with the Mississippi Center for Justice. And if you'd like more uh, to provide input or more information about what we're talking about, they have a website, teachhistory.ms. And speaking of our, our government, we've got the State of the State address is this afternoon at 4. You can watch it. Goodness, you can watch it on MPB TV. You can watch it at MPB Online. You can watch it at Facebook Live, or you can join me and listen to it on MPB Think Radio. We have a couple of calls. Let's go to Cat in Mo. No, wait. John in uh, Alabama has been holding. Uh, no, <laughs> one more time. Neil in Alabama has been holding. Neil, thanks so much for holding. What's your comment or question from Alabama? Hey, thank you for talking to me. Um, You had a caller on earlier who basically was saying uh, that America's a meritocracy, and if you work hard and, you you know, and all this understanding, um, critical race theory, or, to put it another way, the uh, oppression of minorities in the U.S., um, isn't relevant. You just got to work hard, you know, deliver what needs to be delivered, uh, and you and you're good. I think I'd like to respectfully disagree with that caller and say that he demonstrates why it's important for people to understand the history of oppression. Um, not only in this country, but also where I come from in England. I'm white, I'm middle class, and I am privileged. And I understand that. And to pretend otherwise is a fallacy. And I think in order to achieve justice in the world, firstly, we need to have truth and understanding, and then we need reconciliation. And I'll I'll, I'll hope um, to hear your comments about that, and I'll leave it there and listen to what you have to say. Neil, we appreciate you holding on and for your comments. Uh, Chauncey Spears? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I, I really do appreciate that call, and he's exactly right. Um, uh, When you understand history, um, you better understand the present, and you're informed to make a better future. Um, when you, without understanding the role that racial oppression has played in the history and development of this country, you're left to see today's contemporary realities and to see the disparities along racial lines, and you're left to assume that, well, since, you know, if there's a disproportionate number of, for instance, black men who are in prison, for example, well, if you don't understand the history of things like convict leasing in Mississippi or the black codes in Mississippi, uh, you don't understand the, the issue, for instance, with the disparate rendering of the GI Bill after World War II among black Americans or or the uh, redlining that, that prohibited home ownership, which was the linchpin to the middle class in America. Um, then you're left to think that, well, these disparities arise because there obviously there's some kind of cultural defect, intellectual defect, 
some kind of a misunderstanding that they don't have in terms of how to make it in, our to, in, in today's market economy or, or something, or the discipline wasn't there. So basically, you, you're looking at the disparities and you're blaming the people who are on the bottom end of the, of the totem pole in terms of economic distribution and opportunity in this country. And you're saying that there's nothing wrong with the system. It also has to be something wrong with the people. And, and so that's what happens when you don't have a, a firm understanding of the history of this country and the history of how things came to be in this state. And so now if you have that understanding that there's obviously just something wrong to people, then you can begin to understand why people uh, in decision-making capacities in this state do things like, uh, you know, slow to expand Medicaid. They're slow to do means-tested aid for people who are in poverty because they don't have a firm understanding of how we got to this situation we're in in the first place. Because we haven't done a good job of teaching the, what the effects, the causes, and the structures of oppression for minorities in the history of this country, the state, and like the caller said, the whole world. You know, and so that has to be a vital part of your education if you're going to be really a productive citizen in the 21st century world of work and democracy. So, so we have to do something, you know, about understanding history better in our country. Let's go on. We've got quite a few calls. We'll see. We can hope we can get through them. Let's go to Megan in Jackson. Megan, we appreciate you holding on. What's your comment or question? Thank you very much. So before I say anything, I want to say I consider myself a, an independent politically because I can see, uh, you know, depending on the issue, I can go either way. But let me just um, – what I'm going to say are, are facts, and that's the kind of person that I am. It's nuts and bolts. Either it's true or it's not. It's not a theory. It actually was this way. So first of all – from an economic standpoint, the Mississippi, I sat down and, and ca- tallied this up myself, and everybody can do this, and every Mississippian sh- taxpayer should do it. For the three months that the Mississippi legislature convenes in Jackson, the Mississippi taxpayer spends $7 million. Okay? Now, what are we getting for our money? Not much. If they're spending a lot of their time dwelling on uh, what I call a non-issue it you know how is this going to impact the average Mississippian? It it won't. It's just an agenda that a certain party that is affiliated with Alec is pushing around the country. Because if you will notice, a lot of legislatures, this has suddenly become an issue. It's another shiny object. Okay, so and Philip Gunn, Mississippi's uh, Speaker of the House, is the immediate past president of Alec. So that's that's how I perceive it personally. And it's just something, as I said, that they don't want you to think about the fact that, hey, they denied, we've been denied medical marijuana, we've been denied the expansion of Medicaid, don't want to talk about that. So they have to think up something to get everybody riled up in their attention. That's just the nuts and bolts of it. So, you know, as a lifelong Mississippian, I think for myself, which is one reason I choose not to engage in social media because there's so many, quote, opinions and, you know, theories, et cetera, et cetera. Either it is true or it is not. And this critical race theory, if it happened and it's still happening, then why would you want to omit it from the textbooks? It blank brings to mind for me uh, pictures of Germans burning books prior to Hitler's uh, coming into power. So, you know, when we, it's like the professor said, when we start burning books, we tipped over uh, into dangerous territory. And that's what this reminds me of. Thank you, Megan. We appreciate uh, you calling in. We did get an email from Craig. Craig said, China made teaching Tiananmen Square massacre against the law. U.S. states are doing the same with its past. So that is his comment. Let's go to Mobile and see what Kat has to say. Kat, we're glad that you've called in to In Legal Terms today. What's your comment or question? Good morning. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to keep my points concise. <laughs> um, did, Okay, I understand everybody has different backgrounds and different exposure. And so when I speak to different people, 
I keep that in mind, like the gentleman called earlier today, um, has different exposure, different life experiences. Um, but I think about comment, um, like what Mitch McConnell made recently about African Americans voting as Americans. We vote just the same as Americans. And that comment may seem subtle and it may not seem like a big deal to some people because of a lack of understanding. But then when you think about being taught the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and why that was important, that goes back to history. If you don't know your history, it repeats itself. But also, if history didn't affect you in a certain way, it doesn't seem as big of a deal or it hasn't really affected you as much. And so your understanding may not be um, where it should be. And I just... There are so many thoughts and points on this issue. Um, and he's right. There is choice. A critical race theory, I wouldn't think that it's an excuse or a scapegoat for people not trying to do well in school or not putting forth their best effort or anything like that. But you do have to be honest about facts. And we do have to be honest about selective history and why we feel like certain things should be taught and why they shouldn't be taught. Um, and then I guess the last point, because I know time is running down, you have other callers. Um, I've heard people mention in regards to this that they don't want their children to feel bad about who they are because of their history. But it's interesting how I have to teach and I have had to, I've had to be taught by family my history about what my people have experienced because it's important for me to understand the world in which the way that I would experience it. And so it's, I just find it interesting um, how we select what should and should not be taught, what we want to omit. Um, and just, it, it, I, I feel like it can be propaganda to get people wild up and be divisive. And the political timing of all of this, midterms are coming up. We have this party and that party, but even outside of the politics, truth is truth. And history is history. And if you do not know your history, it can repeat itself. And then who would who would take advantage of that? So those are my thoughts. Thank you for your time and all the education that you guys provide. Thank you, Kat. We appreciate you calling in. I'm going to take just a little turn to relate uh, an experience that was in my orbit is I had, uh, you know, my daughter, when she went to public high school in Jackson, she and another boy were the only two white kids in her Mississippi history class. And, yeah, it was hard hearing Mississippi history from a white person's point of view on how uh, people were treated in the past. But it's the truth. And... It, Sometimes it's it's very hard to hear, um, you know, what pe what what humans have done to other humans, and if you happen to resemble some of the human persecutors, that's that's really hard. But it is that's why humans are uh, empathetic, and hopefully we we learn and grow from that. Um, Chauncey Spears, we have just about one minute left. What does this mean about individual teachers teaching about slavery, about Jim Crow, about Tulsa, and about redlining? Uh, you mentioned, you know, there was a conference that was canceled because the, they were scared to have this uh, professional development. What does this mean in Mississippi? Oh, yeah. W w one quick point before, before I get to that. Um, um, there's nothing wrong with feeling bad about true history. Um, there, are, there are things in our history that ought to shake you to your core in terms of your moral center. You know, when we talk about genocides, when we talk about uh, uh, rape, when we talk about uh, uh, things like, like the, uh, the Trail of Tears, when we talk about you know, denying women rights, when we talk, these things should shake young people's moral center. You know, there, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, uh, but we have to trust that our teachers are, are able 
to to navigate those issues in a way that gets them to learn from those experiences, learn from that feeling, and be informed as a civically engaged student and as a civically engaged adult as a result of that. We talk about what this kind of legislation could do for teachers in those continued uh, contexts. If you can't expand upon that history in a way that makes kids make connections to how we can make it a better future, then you're crippling our opportunity as, as, as public citizens in providing an education to our children in the state, and it's going to cripple us going forward as a state. Oh, better future. I like that. Let's end that on uh, teaching to help us have a better future. Thank you so much, Chauncey Spears from the Mississippi Center for Justice, for being on our show today. We've loved having you. Thank you. Thank you. That's going to wrap us up for today's show. Thank you, Java Chapman. Thank you, Jay White, for helping us put on our show. And thank you so much for Professor Richard Gershon, who hosts from the University of Mississippi School of Law. I'm Liz Gill. We want you to join us next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Central for In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio.